What's up? It's episode 128, Pain Points of Wealth, and earnings season is upon us. Bank stocks coming in with better than expected or less bad earnings. Less bad earnings is good for stock prices. Tech stocks still melting up here. Is this melt up going to continue? Can this rally sustain itself throughout the rest of the year? How should you position your portfolio? We're going to answer all those questions. And the economy, everyone's talking about it from hard landing to soft landing. Remarkable. They must have been listening to our podcast because we've talked about a soft landing for a long time. We're going to get into the weeds when it comes to the economy, what you should be thinking about right now. And on the tipping point today, we're going to talk about the cookie cutter approach. Wall Street loves to sell you a cookie cutter financial plan. Do you have one? How do you fix it so you're ready for your financial independence? Check it out. We have a phenomenal show. Guys, you all know I'm a baby boomer, and I and most of my clients are older than I am, and they all tend to say things are so bad. Well, here's the thing. The market doesn't care whether things are good or bad. They want to know if things are getting better or worse. GDP up, inflation down, things are getting better. That's why the market loves it. Well, you know, my clients are really excited about the fact that inflation's coming down. I mean, we keep talking about it in all my monthly calls, and uh, you know, I'd say the only thing that's really overly inflated here is Ryan's ego. <laughs> I guess if the sun <laughs> rises in the east, uh, you know, that's just going to keep growing over time, um, and rightly so. But, you know, I think the bottom line here is inflation is coming down, and that's how stocks are priced. They're priced to inflation and interest rates. And if inflation is coming down, we know interest rates are starting to come down, like the 10 years at 3.7%. Well, <clears throat> stock prices readjust to that, to the positive. Just like last year, as interest rates and inflation was going up, stock prices went down. It's kind of that simple on one level. Well, it's yeah, that simple, also- and that's the basic tenet of investing, right? Inflation is the biggest risk every single person listening to us right now has. Inflation is not going away. It's always there. That's why you need to have – on part of your portfolio has always got to be in the stock market because it's the only hedge against inflation. Well, you know what? Those higher rates, though, have benefited. I mean, if you look at the banks, all the uh, earnings came in for J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. You know, they're all benefiting from making those loans at higher rates, so – you know, it's, it's been helpful for the economy, too. Well, it's another reason why we got to keep pulling our clients' money out of the banks, because the banks are making money because they're paying you 67 basis points, and they're making five just when you're sitting with your money at the bank. So there's, you know, there's good and bad in everything. Uh, we care more about you making money than the banks. Well, Bob, because you're so benevolent. Um, but no, that's, it's a really good point because, you know, bottom line is, look, it, it's all about earnings, right? And we're going to the next second half of the year here. The question is, well, can this keep up? Has things gone too far too fast? But the bottom line is when you start looking at earnings out to the future, they're starting to look pretty good. And, you know, Bob, we, we, we talk about these stats all the time, but there's one stat that analysts, their expectations of what earnings are going to be are always too pessimistic. Almost like 85% of the time they're lowering their estimates for the future, and they're usually wrong. So everything's skewed towards negativity. Hence, the surprises are usually in the positive. Yeah, it's kind of like the Roadrunner cartoon. They're always trying to catch the, the Roadrunner, and they never can. They always seem to be behind. Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, that's the bottom line. You look out next couple quarters, uh, you know, earnings are going to continue to increase. I mean, next year, we're looking at double-digit earnings growth in the S&P 500. And if you want to go all the way up to 2025, which is a little bit dangerous because a lot can happen, but a lot of the, the experts we follow um, are looking at earnings growth that year, too. So the foreseeable future, things are going to grow Meanwhile, investors are still sitting on their hands trying to figure out what to do, paralysis by analysis. But, you know, I kind of see where the arrow is pointing here, guys. Well, well you, know, you have to always think long term. I mean, when you look at the history of the markets, they always go up. And, you know, back almost 50 years ago when I started at Mother Merrill, all they were concerned with was what's the next 100 point move? And Wall Street's never changed. They only care about what's going to happen in the next 100 points when you're sitting there with the S&P at 4,500. They're talking about maybe it goes to 3,100. Well, it's going to go to 10,000. So what are you going to do about the fact that it's going to go to 10,000? Well, who cares what happens every day and every week? Um, well, Bob, if people didn't care, we wouldn't have a job. So <laughs> let's be thankful <laughs> that they do have some interest. But no, no, I think the other, the other interesting point is we're starting to see that broadening out of the rally. You know, we've talked a lot about how small caps yeah. are starting to move. Um, the dollar's plummeted here. We've talked about international for a long time. International is starting to break out too, which is a really healthy sign in a bull mm-hmm. market. And it's also... 
a really interesting time because we know when you're buying the S&P 500, we talked about this a lot, it's just overridden by seven stocks, the Magnificent Seven, right? Those big tech names. But that could be very, very dangerous because at some point if they stop working, well, your risk in the S&P 500 is huge. Well, that's the thing. They're the known, known beneficiaries of artificial intelligence, but their little secret is every industry is going to benefit from artificial intelligence. And then the future Amazons and Apples and Googles and Facebooks <clears throat> are the stocks that are in the small cap and mid cap indices, companies we've never heard of, but will be known names 20 years from now. Hey, guys, 20 years, 20 years ago, I never heard of Amazon or Google, right, or Meta. And, uh, you know, you want to be in the companies that are going to be the next meta. You don't want to be necessarily putting all your eggs in one basket. Yet, I still get a lot of calls from people asking, hey, do you think we should buy Tesla here because it's cheap? Or do you think <laughs> Amazon's a good buy here or meta? Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it can be pretty scary on a relative basis, I think. I always say, yes, Chris, I want you to buy that one and the 9,900 other companies we own. Yeah. Well, you know, Dad, I always like what you say. It's like, okay, well, those are great, but yeah. what's, what's going to be the next big one? You know, success is always recognized in hindsight, right? I, I, literally every call I've gotten the last two weeks was, should we buy some NVIDIA here at 700 times earnings? Well, you're also starting to see some of the places where it's not working, right? Like we talk about Amazon, um, or the experts like to talk about Amazon a lot. It's in the same place it was three years ago. That's a long time for a stock to be in the same place, right? And meanwhile, you know, markets have done really well over three years. That's one mega cap name that's done nothing. Um, and I think that's your risk here is at some point, you know, the tide does change and whatever's hot, whatever we love today is not what we're going to love in the future. And we've talked about this, I think, on prior podcasts. But Bob, back in the day, right, Cisco, Oracle, um, these names are like we never talk about them anymore. Um, and they're really just getting back to where they were 20 years ago. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Um, but that's what it's going to look like in the future. Creative destruction is always happening. We just don't know where it's going to come from, even though we wish we did. Guys, isn't that what makes investing so hard? You know, our clients' portfolios hit an all-time record high a little over a year or so ago. And it's almost like they sit around waiting and say, oh, I really can't take action until it gets back to the high point that it was. They never remember, you know, they started 200, you know, 2 million, $3 million uh, 10 years ago um, in appreciation. So it's it, it, investing so hard. The market only spends like 5% of the time at its all time high and spends most of the time giving you buying opportunities. And it, it, it's just so sometimes hard to communicate that. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, we, we're talking about a lot of positive news here. Another positive uh, piece of information that I came across my desk is that the, the FOMC, or as we like to call it, the Federal Open Mouth Committee, <laughs> is not allowed to talk publicly again until July the 27th, which I think we can all agree, every time they open their mouth, the market tends to go the way we don't want it to go. Well, well clearly, Chris, the way the market's rampant right now, I don't think anybody cares what they have to say yeah. anymore. <laughs> Well, and that, that's also something to be aware of, too, right? Because the pendulum does swing, right? Everyone was overly negative. And, well, you could get to that dangerous point here where everyone gets overly optimistic, right? So it, it's kind of funny. We're starting to see that change happen now where a lot of these experts are starting to dial back what they said before. They're starting to change their opinion. And now everyone's starting to reinforce that, look, the economy is not so bad. Well, well, thanks. You know, you should have told me that like 12 months ago, but they didn't. So I think you have to be careful on the other end here, too, because now the, the outlook could become a lot more rosy. And it's only verifying what the market's already done, because most of us are playing Monday morning quarterback. So it's another thing to be aware of here is just like, are things getting too frothy? And I think, you know, we talked about tech again. That's a place that you have to be really careful here. It's so important to spread your money out. Because as you can see, things change on a dime and very unexpectedly. Well, you know, Chris, you know, we, we all watch the financial news, so our clients don't have to. Um, but all they, they focus on is what the Fed's doing, the Fed's doing, and, and, and everything about what the Fed's doing is negative. Well, you know what, guys? I think we got to give the Fed some kudos here. It looks like they've navigated into a soft landing. I mean, turns out a lot of the uh, inflation was transitory, like they originally said. And the economy is slowing down, but not enough to go into recession. Um, but I just hope Jerome Powell wakes up one day and takes the victory lap because I think he should right now. Should never give the Fed credit. You're not allowed to do <laughs> I know, that. probably yeah. jinxing it. The soft landing says oxygen masks don't pop out. <laughs> yeah, and meanwhile, look, I mean, bottom line is if you look out into the future, uh, read the tea leaves as we like to do. As you mentioned, Bob, um, growth in this country is actually picking up, it's accelerating. Uh, you look at the job market, it's still hot for every 1.6 jobs available, only one person looking. Wages are going up over inflation. So, I mean, everything in the backdrop says, you know, we have what we call that Goldilocks economy where it's not too hot, not too cold. And I think that's what you're seeing right now. So as an investor right now, you've got to look into the future optimistically. 
spread out your money. Don't concentrate it in one area and you should be rewarded over the long term. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 128, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially literally at any stage of your journey. Bob, Chris, and I literally have over 75 years of collective experience helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. And if you're thinking to yourself, you want a more hands-on approach, you want to figure out what you're doing right now, well, if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence, Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. There's no other firm out there that will do this work up front. We're going to build you your own personalized financial portal, give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we're going to hone in on every issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take Social Security? There's a lot of ways to take it. One right way for you. How do you draw from your portfolio without running out of money, factoring in inflation? We're going to put together a dynamic income plan. We're going to look at diversification. Has your market been like a yo-yo the last two years as markets have been extremely volatile? Or have you been sitting with way too much money in cash? Paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do. We're going to put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we're going to look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost products that are fee laden and tax inefficient. We're going to do a deep dive of every investment you own, show you how to reduce the cost on your portfolio on those annuities, mutual funds, brokerage products, structured products, show you how to optimize for taxes and basically give you our full tax playbook. It's not what you make, it's what you take. Literally go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris at our firm, Pain Capital Management, of course, that's P-A-Y-N-A. When it comes to all the families that we advise, you know, we really find that you need unique customized solutions for you to solve all your problems when it comes to you know being financially free or living off your portfolio. So I thought we could talk today about how dangerous it is when you get cookie cutter advice. And let's face it, a lot of our industry, that's all they do is they give co cookie cutter advice that doesn't really work. No, they really don't. It's like uh, they're not process oriented. They're product oriented. They have a product to sell. Uh, I was listening to a uh, competitor of ours that was on national TV. They advertise very heavily. And they say, well, we don't create cooker cutter, cutter portfolios, but every portfolio we've seen from them is identical. <laughs> so they have a different name for cookie cutter. I don't know what it is. Well, I think the only thing you get with a cookie cutter portfolio are a bunch of crumbs. And, you know, as a matter of fact, I was, I was actually talking to a prospective client recently, and we were going through their financial plan. And their, their current advisor told them to take Social Security as early as possible at the age of 62. But what they didn't tell them is that you make more than 21000 a year you're going to get penalized. So for every $2 you make, Social Security takes a dollar away from your benefit. And it's a great point, because. but then again, if you're not working, it might be a good time to take it at 62. So again, it really just depends on your situation. Like we never give the same advice on Social Security for everybody, because for everyone's situation, it might make sense to take it differently. It really does, because, you know, you have a spouse that, that may be able to benefit from you taking it early, or, you know, you have a situation where it may be beneficial to take it later. Um, unfortunately, I just went to a funeral where one of our clients, uh, parent lived to a hundred, right? So I recommended she wait till she was 70 to take her social security. And now she's getting the maximum, uh, while she's 72 now. So it's, you know, every situation's different and that's why it's all got to be based on your financial plan, working backwards from where you want to go. Yeah. And not that's a lot right. of people do that. Well, we know this Bob, cause you literally just got five or six proposals from competing firms, all the major firms just to see what they're offering right now. Number one, they all looked alike. Number two, none of them ran any sort of financial projections ahead of time, like to put the cart before the horse is crazy. And it ended up just being like, hey, we're gonna buy this large cap portfolio over here, another large cap portfolio over here. We're gonna buy some taxable bonds over here. Meanwhile, they were in a high tax bracket, they could use tax-free income. But it's remarkable that none of these firms, before giving you recommendations, Think about your financial plan. They're just offering you product, which makes no sense at all. Let me ask you and Chris a question. Are you conservative investors? Are you moderately aggressive? Or are you aggressive? Uh, based on your answers, I'm going to build a portfolio for your $10 million account. So be careful how you answer me. Yeah, it's like going to the doctor and tell him what kind of prescription you want. Yeah. yeah. Like, hey, doc, prescribe me something. What's wrong with you? I can't tell you. I'm busy. 
Well, you always say this, Bob, but it's like, okay, we're all more aggressive when the market's going up, right? Our animal spirits are yeah. higher. We think we can take on more risk. So if we answer that risk tolerance test, then you're going to get a very different answer than if the market's at its bottom, right? The economy is in the, uh, in the gutter and everyone's feeling really gloomy. You're probably going to be more risk averse. And, you know, that makes no sense, right? When you're building a financial no. plan. It's like, how do you feel today? Let's build your portfolio on how you feel today. And we know emotions, when it comes to investing, are a horrible combination. You're absolutely right. I mean, and, and that's my favorite question, too. Uh, when, I, when I speak to somebody, talking to another advisor, I say, well, what their, their risk tolerance questionnaires have six questions or 10 questions or 20. Um, and you're right, right? You'll answer it depending on how your statement did the last month. If it's up big, you're real aggressive in your answers. If it's down big, then you're going to be real conservative. So, it, it, you know, you really got to run numbers. I mean, it's that simple. It's, it's, a, it's math, guys. And it's, you know, not a lot of people will take the time to do it. And again, what we said earlier, inflation is the biggest enemy. Well, one of the things, one of my favorite Bobisms is like, you know, how you know you have a truly diversified portfolio. It's, it's when you don't like everything that you own. <laughs> That's right. If you're not ticked off at something right now, Chris, you're not diversified. Right. It's the old, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Um, right. Because if everything's going up at the same time, well, guess what? It's probably all going to go down at the same time. And then you're going to be very, very unhappy. The other thing I mentioned about that too, Bob, just looking at all these different proposals that you receive from these firms is when you do a cookie cutter, you're not thinking about taxes at all. And I just mentioned this, yeah. but it's like you had a, a couple that were in a high income bracket getting proposed. Every single portfolio they proposed had taxable bonds. Right, which means the income is going to be taxed at a 38% bracket. Whereas if they would have just been more customized and tweaked it from a tax perspective, that would have been so much more money in their pocket. But they didn't even factor that in. It's insane. Yeah, I mean, and a couple of these, a couple of these clients that, that that I was getting the proposals for, they're going to be in the highest marginal bracket for at least another 10 or 15 years, um, and not one proposal was tax efficient in in terms of the proposals. So it's just um, the little things that make the difference, guys, right? I mean, the markets are going to do what they do over time. But those little tweaks, those little tax savings that mount to millions of dollars in your lifetime. Well, you know, one of the things I find, especially with newer clients that we bring in, when we look at their, their current portfolios, is that they've got money everywhere. It's like that change that you find in the couch. And the one thing that I often find is like they have the 401k here. They've got something at Morgan Stanley. They've got something at Merrill Lynch. None of these things are working together. Like nothing's working in concert. You know, they've got... You know, one portfolio that's individual stocks, one's mutual funds, and it doesn't make any sense, and they have no cohesive plan. And again, that goes back to tax planning as well. You make the best tax plan where you see where everything is, and you just can't do that if you have an account that's invested this way at this firm, an account that's invested another way at another firm. It just doesn't work. Hey, guys, I, I know it's been really good this year, and, and since October, the, the market's made a bottom. We've been in a big booming bull market. But you know what? There's going to be another bear market, and it's going to be a bear market in different asset classes. And these portfolios aren't built to take advantage of it. I mean, what good is it if the market drops 40% if you don't have any asset available to invest in that, you know, that when that market goes on sale? No one takes that into account. And, and better yet, if you go back through history, they never take advantage of it. They sit there and they suck their thumb and hope everything works out. Well, that, that's yeah, but exactly Dad, right. I own the I own the Columbia Threadneedle Multi Asset Positivity Fund. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that better than your leveraged cash position yeah. right now, Chris? Yeah. Look, as long as you ignore the fees, it's a great yeah. fund, and it owns two stocks, Apple and Nvidia. That's it. So, <laughs> um, which that's all you need to own anyway. So, but no, no, it's it's a great point because Bob, you always talk about risk is only known in hindsight. So you really need to know your risk ahead of time. And that's where if you're looking at everything in a concerted view, you can actually look and see where the concentrated risk is because you're not going to know it ahead of time, right? You're only going to know it when your portfolio is already down 40%. So it's really being proactive and making sure that your risk is in line way before uh, you know, the, the shoe drops. And I think that's the biggest mistake investors make. It's always like they're scrambling when the market finally capitulates. They didn't realize how much risk they had. Last year was a great example of that. And then they're in shock. Like, I thought I had a really safe portfolio. So you have to really be proactive when it comes to risk. And most of you aren't doing that. Well, these, these proposals paint a beautiful picture. Some of these articles, I mean, just saw another article in the financial press about Amazon. If you'd have bought it on the new issue, how much wealth you'd have today. Well, guess what? If they're the first year when they went public, you were down 90%. You're going to tell me you put $10 million in Amazon, you're down $9 million, and you're still long the stock? I doubt it. You probably uh, you know, took a long walk off a short bridge. And that's the thing about risk is so emotional, right? We, we have, as human beings, I think it's probably something that like helps us. 
is when we think back to the past, we forget how painful and horrible it is when markets are selling off. The news is really dire. Like, I think we're, we're at the point now where people even forget how horrible the great financial crisis is. Uh, but when we were yeah. in it, you were living it, and the S&P 500 went to 666. It was a horrible day, <laughs> you know? But we, we forget that because, you know, the, I think the human spirit tends to, like, uh, brush over the bad things in the past and look at the optimistic future, which is good. But it's important to remember those lessons because when they happen again, you're not going to be as tenacious and be like, oh, I'll just wait for things to get better again. It's not that easy. Hey, guys, it's, that's actually a good characteristic of human beings. I mean, I, I forgot to tell you about all the things I did when I was a teenager because, you know, I forgot those things. A good thing. I didn't scar you for life. Um, <laughs> but, Chris, how many conversations you had recently where the clients don't even remember what happened when, the, when COVID and when the pandemic struck and the market dropped 35 percent? They have no memory of that. Yeah, it's really unbelievable. I mean, it was just three years ago, and I often bring it up, and you know, just just not even a thought. Oh, we had a pandemic. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, I was going over a client's performance the other day, and I said, "Oh, there was that big drop we had, in, you know, March of 2020." They go, "There was a there was a big drop." Oh my gosh, I didn't even realize it. I said, yeah, we sold bonds and took advantage of it. I don't remember that. So it's a good thing we have a good memory. It's a good thing we track these things. That's why you need a customized plan that keeps your emotions in check. Because bottom line is you're an emotional being and your emotions are going to lead you astray to make horrible financial decisions, to leave you off the cliff away from financial independence. You've got to have structure. You have, you have to have customization. You know, Ryan, I love that. You always say, hey, don't fall in love with an investment because that investment loves you back. Let's attach that emotional resolve to achieving your goals and dreams. All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, during the strong recovery following the great virus crisis, there you go, the GFC, GVC rather, analysts scrambled to raise their forecast for six straight quarters from the second quarter of 2020 through the third quarter of 2021, but they still couldn't come close to the actual earnings. The S&P 500 recorded an unusually high double-digit percentage earnings beat for the first time since the aftermath of the great financial crisis, again, analysts are always behind the eight ball. Yeah, I also got to wonder if there's a little financial engineering that goes on there, Rye, because, you know, they do depend on the C-suite executives that give them information about how the current quarter's going. And, you know, they keep the just cutting and under-promising all through the quarter, and then bang, on the day of the announcement of the earnings, you know, they deliver. Um, so maybe if you're a smart investor, you know, you can, tra you can trade on that a little bit. Yeah, no, exactly. It's like the CEO and the CFO, they just like manage expectations. They lower the bar so low that, what do you know? They beat everything they told you that you should expect every time. It's like the same game played over and over with the analysts. They never catch on. <laughs> All right, Chris, a Powerball player in California hit the jackpot last week, winning $1.08 billion, the third largest take of its type in history. The prize is subject to a 37% federal income tax. However, California surprisingly doesn't tax lottery wins. So there's no state tax on that winning. Whereas if you're in New York, by contrast, one of the worst places to be a lottery winner, you'd have a 10.9% tax. Plus, if you live in the city, another 3.9%. I think you can still do pretty good with a billion dollars less 37 percent in taxes well you know here's the way to look at it you know they when they pay the lottery out you can take a lump sum they take 52 percent up front then you're basically paying another 50 percent in taxes i don't know about you guys but if i had 250 million dollars in my pocket clear i'd be pretty happy <laughs> i tell you what you know i never give government too much credit but what a what a brilliant strategy right a voluntary st tax on the uninformed and then they tax the tax money that they they have they collected so, you know, I don't know why anybody would ever, anybody would ever buy a lottery ticket. All right. Well, 37%, almost 40% in taxes. Yeah, the government, they've got it uh, They've got it wired, as they say. All right, gentlemen, great show. Thank you for listening to the show. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, please. If you're listening on iTunes, give us a five-star rating. Leave a comment. Say how great we are, especially Chris. He needs it for his ego. If you're listening to this on Spotify right now, you can subscribe. If it's on YouTube right now, you can like this episode. You can subscribe to our channel and click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.